Mark Ellis. G'day, mate. Welcome to Between Two Beers. Thank you kindly. I told you it'd be underwhelming. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're here in the Export Beer Garden studio, drinking beer with Mark Ellis. Is this a pinch yourself moment, Shay? You, you were a bit nervous before this one. Very nervous. Like, not going to lie to you. <laughs> Idolised you growing up to the point where people would say, why are you trying to talk like Mark Ellis? So I will do my best to not parrot you while we're speaking so people already have trouble differentiating between Stephen and I. Well, that's the reason I'm uh, not wearing those because I don't like the sound of my own voice. Well, you, you know, so I'm you, glad you did. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. Hey, we, we were just chatting Vespa before, but did you just nip down from, from K Road on the Vespa to get here? No, no, we, uh, we've been working on K Road for about 10 years, and, uh, but I, I went home, went home and had a, had a sauna, you see, to just sweat the uh, poison out before I put it in. We're going straight back into the maturity. Like that. Have you still got the men's club? It's, it's sort of uh, an invite only. We, used to, we the, the, co the concept came to us about 10 years ago. You go to a pub these days and 90% of the people there you don't really want to be with. Um, and uh, the beers are like 14 bucks each, you know. That just doesn't make sense to me, you know. So when we are at university, a dozen was 20 bucks and four jugs were 20 bucks. So it sort of made sense. You'd want to go to the pub and have a few beers because you might get a wink, you know. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, much better than uh, drinking uh, a dozen beers at home. Whereas, uh, so we set this up and we, we bring beer in by the pallet and you, we charge, you know, I think it's 30 bucks a, a, a week or 30 bucks a month or something like that. Either way, with the membership we've got, that covers the overheads. And when you come in, if you decide after you've had your cricket net, because we've mm. got a full net with a bowling machine and big screen TVs, and uh, if you decide to have a beer, it's on you as a, you know, as a member who's bought the locker effectively so there's a little bit of le legal wiggle room there but very good it's pretty much a speakeasy at this Dunedin speakeasy the, the cricket net I'd heard a story that you nearly killed yourself there uh, alone with the bowling machine yeah very excited we got we got the bowling machine and uh, it was one that can crank up to 100 mile an hour and uh, the bowling machines it's a lot quicker than an arm because you don't see the arm coming over so you can't sort right. of predict the release it just flashes like then boom you know it comes and so I was facing it at 85 mile an hour, but I had it on a half volley length. Yeah. But you can press both buttons, which make it sort of random. Yeah. And uh, so some are slightly in swing, some are out duckers. And this one, as soon as it left, I went, oh, I'm fucked. <laughs> and, uh, and, it, and it was right at the toes, and I thought, if I miss this, I'm shot. Yeah. And I missed it, and it hit my back leg and blew it out <laughs> and just dropped me onto the floor. And I was writhing around, you know, I broke my foot, writhing around, going, oh, and then, boom, another ball came past. <laughs> And if it had hit me, it would have been just the best way to die. Yeah. You know, just getting cleaned out, you know, having a net by yourself and the guys come and think, and there's just balls, you know, you're lying amongst balls. I reckon that would have been the perfect exit. Well, Apart from maybe getting to like 80 and, you know, then handing your mates all like a button and saying, I want to jump, I want to be the first person to jump from the North Island to the South Island on a motorbike. Yeah. And nobody can stop you because you, that's your dream and you actually believe you're going to do that. So at the end of it, you're 80 and you're riddled with something. You just get up the top of the ramp <laughs> and just come flying down. And all your mates have to hit the button so nobody knows who's blowing you up. But <laughs> you just explode with all the Dilwali colours. I reckon that would be a nice way to sign off as well. So here's hoping for the, uh, the latter a, rather than the former. Yeah, yeah two wow. great we ways. We dodged one bullet there, but that's my plan. Two great ways to go. I just love the thought of you in this place. 100 mile hour balls coming down, you're just there by yourself, battling away. Like that's you, you, you get the, the guys after a couple of sherbets who say, yeah, I'll, I'll face 100. And you know, we've got a seating in behind it, and so we all just go down there and go, what do you reckon, Barney? You know, and have a bit of a natter to one another, and then, boom, and nobody's, nobody's done it with any aplomb. <laughs> yeah. And there's been a lot of sort of semi-serious injuries. One guy didn't want to wear a box because it wasn't his own. I was going to ask you, are you padded up and protective? Oh, yeah, 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 okay, okay. Fully. Good. Yeah. And, Helmet? Uh, uh, no, I never wore a helmet. Okay. Never in my life. Uh, playing uh, cricket, I just couldn't couldn't see through the bloody visor. I mean, uh, we, and we 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 played rep cricket with Heath Davis, who was you know pretty erratic and sort of as fast as Richard had me when when we were thirteen, and that was <laughs> horrific. But uh, no, never never a helmet, dude. Yeah. And, and neither was Heath Davis. Actually, famously took one on the. Uh yeah, but he, he, he brushed that off. He, he's a, uh, you know, he's he's one hell of an individual. Yeah, we need to get him on the show. Actually, yeah, yeah he he you do an incredible, bloody good yeah. guest. Yeah, yeah. he, he, he would. Uh, yeah, you need you need a few hours. Um, I had another question about the speakeasy, but we can leave it because we've probably already said too much. Uh, we always like to start uh, these episodes with a few yarns. 
to paint a picture of a guest's personality. And we've had some mail from an old friend of yours who you might know as Ben Hickey or the audience might know as the human cannonball, <laughs> who we'll talk about later. He said, you are extremely competitive. Everything is a competition and you're also a severe hypochondriac. And he suggested we ask you about a story that combines the two. So can you tell us about the time you did your first 80k bike ride around Lake Topo with no training? Oh, well, well, Ben's one of my type five. He's one of my dearest mates. I've got a, a penchant for gingers and uh, they're, they're incredibly loyal and uh, they've got a very high pain threshold. <laughs> uh, you know, prone to anger outbursts, but they're just the most amazing companion and he uh, uh, is second to none. So if it had been anyone else, I wouldn't answer the question, but he, he decided that, you know, we had a tragic accident, Ben and I, where, where he, we went down to Opedo Bay where I've got my little uh, beach house and he was desperately uh, tuning this young lady who was a little bit like Harry and Megan. It was a bit of a reach, you know, <laughs> yeah, but we all came around, gathered around and facilitated and whenever we went diving, he w would always follow me because he was just bloody hopeless under the water, like a sea cow. And uh, he decided to go diving with her and, and, and it was a bit rough, like white caps and you know, you, you definitely want to go due west when you hit the bottom, buddy. And uh, he was, you know, and, and just all over the shop and he went due north and she ended up getting over the rocks, getting washed oh. over the rocks. And so we go in with the boat and we managed to extract her out. And then he, he'd lost her. He came up like five minutes later, you know, going, oh, where is she? And she's lying prone on the deck of the boat. And so we went in to get him. And as we went in to get him, a, a wave sort of got me and it was going to pinch him against the rocks. So I said to the boys, drop him. And I floored him, bing, you know. And he went, ah, you've broken my foot. And then he went, whoa, you've cut it off. So uh, we're pretty tight. And uh, whilst it, it sort of half of it was off, they put it back on. And uh, um, what was the story that we were? <laughs> was a, I'm just a, sort of trying to paint the picture yeah. of you know how much it, it we was, love one it, another. You know, it was the bike bike race. Ah, so bike well, he got race. it. He wanted, you know, so he decides to take up cycling because he's not much of a runner after that incident. And uh, so we go around uh, around Taupo, and uh, he's always late. And uh, we we come in and the. You know, the gun's about to go and everyone's bloody there in their leotards. And I said, give me the bloody bike, mate. I'm out of here. I'm, I'm doing this now because I'm really pissed off we're late. So I jumped on the bike just as a bang goes and, you know, whoof, I'm off, right? And I'm with the first group for the first sort of, you know, let's say if it's 160K, so it's 80 I was doing. And it was the lumpy bit. Anyone who's gone around Taupo, I chose the uphill, which wasn't great. But I was with the lead peloton, I think it's called, for the first 10 minutes. Um or 10k and then you know and, and feeling pretty good and then we sort of hit the hills and i couldn't get the thing into the lower gears so i was sort of having to go sideways and do the s bends oh, up the hill wow, in yeah. order to grind up there really, and really, uh, really going to work by that stage i got saliva hanging out the side of my head and it was also the seat just a wee bit too high so every time you rode it was you know just doing that on your just under your yeah and that got pretty uncomfortable um and uh, by the end of it, uh, you know, about 40k through, I was, you know, falling quite considerably back. And Ben tells a story that I, I sort of got to the 80 mark, yard mark and a guy, Gavin Fulsham, who represented New Zealand in wheelchair. The nickname uh, that we were given was Legs. Le yeah, well, that's his nickname was Legs, because <laughs> you know, he, he had none. And, uh, but he, he came over the line and Ben said, oh, where's Mark? And he said, oh, mate, I just passed him about 5k back. And, and I came up the hill and I was just falling to bits, you know, slagging out of the mouth. And I lost feeling in the old fella, uh, you know, to such an extent that I thought, shit, I'm, I'm ruined. I'm going to have to. So I went to the team doctor and said, look, mate, I, uh, there's a problem problem here. And he said, look, you know, uh, don't worry, you've just pinched a nerve. It'll, it'll all come back. The feeling will come back. Just pretend it's somebody else's. <laughs> now, where's the upside in that? <laughs> I've still to this day, you know, thought that maybe that was just an errant thing that was said. But, you know, where's the upside in and pretending it's somebody else's. I, I didn't want to do that. That, that was, uh, that was uh, so he got his own back, effectively, by putting me around Taupo. Yeah. Word for word. That, yeah, that, very, very Word accurate. for word um, retelling of that story. The, the, the well, I, I know not to lie, because uh, <laughs> the truth will always out. Yeah. You know? I, lo I just loved the image of you, because he said you were like one of the leaders after 20K, after 40K, you were a couple of pelotons back, 
and the wheels started to fall off. I love the thought of you, no training. Fuck it, I'm gonna do this bike ride. I'm gonna fucking try and win. Well, a centimeter then, too much is a lot because you're sort of knobbing over it from side to side, and then if you can't get into the low gears going up the hills, I was literally yes bending. Yeah. And I was so pissed off because I was with these guys on the flat, and then falling behind, and then I catch them down the hill, and oh, by 80k, it was. Did you a, have the padded explosion. crotch? Yeah. Oh, even with yeah. the padded crotch, yeah. you were in trouble downstairs. Oh, I was, I was, I was, I was like the guys who go to Ponsby Road on the day. <laughs> exactly the same. But even yeah. even had clip and shoes and yeah, stuff. Right, you know, right. It's amazing. But yeah, I think that gives a little insight into the uh, person. Oh, I'm, not, a, I'm not sure hypochondriac is fair there. It seems like you had a, a genuine Oh, we, we've had a few. Uh, he, he reckons he's put me in hospital a few times and, you know, I've only put him in hospital once, but maybe for a longer duration. So I think we're about break even. Yeah. Can we just loop back to the severed foot situation? Is that a genuine... Yeah, it, was, it wasn't good. Um... It was actually uh, a bit of a panic for everyone. I had one, my best best mate, uh, Simon, just he stood down on the end of the boat and started panicking and just clapping his hands going, come on, <laughs> come on, like one of those energizer bunnies. He just completely lost the plot. And so I said to Woody, who's, who kept it quite close, he said, get in the water, mate, and tell me how fucking bad it is. And he, he swung over and he's a ruatoria, uh, a, a wire a farmer, sharer, and he got in the water and then he poked his head up. He said, oh, it's not good, boy. <laughs> You know, and that's when I knew we were in a bit of trouble and we managed to get the, you know, the, the chopper came in and it was Lana's uh, brother-in-law, I think, and he was meant to take him because we were located to Waikato Hospital, but he took him to, uh, to, to Auckland and that, it just happened to be that the second best foot surgeon in the world is a Kiwi and he happened to be there with these team of people who put this bloody foot back together. Wow. <laughs> like I gave him a kiss on the cheek and said, ah, oh, best of British old boy on the way because... <laughs> I thought he was getting the, the leather strap and it was coming off the knee. But if it had, he's such a guy that he would have just said, oh, mate, well, this one's bloody better in here. <laughs> you know, he's one of those. He's yeah. just a, never never had a bad, he's never mentioned it, you know. And just to close it off, did he get the girl? Yeah, he did for a while. Um, and, and then she came to visit him, you know, in the, in the hospital quite a bit. And the problem with the morphine is it clogs you up. Mm. So you reckon that was the worst part of the whole experience was having to give, give birth to the Antichrist after about 10 days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a strong I'm, start. Yeah, yeah it's, it's good. I'm, I'm looking forward to talking more about Cannonball and the Gimp and either and all them well, later. Well, Gimp is Simon, the guy who lost the plot. <laughs> and started going at this one. You know? <laughs> I mean, we, they were all on the boat. Yeah. It was incredible. And Apart on the show. From, Amazing. Yeah, and on the show. Well, Lee, Rick wouldn't let us have the Gimp, you know, he, you know, because he had a son who was 10 and and the Gimp was, that was my favourite. We did some, some wonderful things with the Gimp. Yeah, look, we got, we're going to get into that. I just want to start. Um, I've heard you say that your life is kind of broken into chapters. And there's the rugby chapter, the TV chapter, the Charlie's chapter. We haven't really seen much of you in the last 10 years. Like, we're so happy and honoured that you're here sharing us with. But we wondered what the last chap- what the last 10 years have been, what the chapter is. Well, kids, you know, which is the most important one. And, you know, hence the radio silence, really. You know, I mean, uh, the, the ability to get away with what we got away with and, you know, for stuff to sort of rear its head with uh, social media. And we, we just had a little golden patch and, you know, you ride the wave and jump off it before it crashes. So that was the plan. And so I'm very uh, happily a dad these days. And that's my sort of primary focus. That oh, and and uh, I've, got, I've got a little uh, uh, advertising agency. So we, we keep under the radar and do a little bit of work yeah. for Toyota here and have done offshore. Well. Blanco? Yeah. Thank you. Um, how old are the kids? Uh, 12. Uh, 13, sorry, 13 just turned, uh, nearly 12, um, nearly 5, nearly 3. Wow. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a busy time. Stephen will be minding you for tips towards the end of this uh, this episode because he's 3, soon to be 4 as well. Yeah, well, you're Catholic. <laughs> no, I'm not. It's yeah, just, nor, nor am I, but they get you in the end, don't they? Yeah, he's right. just prolific. <laughs> yeah. He's a, he's a so, prolific marksman. Apparently there's a, there's a Chinaman at the bottom of the town. <laughs> <laughs> Cash shops? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He uses the old tailing rings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I might go see him. Hey, um, we'd love to sort of paint the picture, and we want to go back to the start. Wellington, childhood growing up, only child. Uh, we've sort of got a, our own – I'm sure everyone has a, their own picture of what they think Mark Ellis would have been like at school. Is it accurate? Cheeky class clown guy who's sort um, of for everything? I, I certainly lacked, I think, for a wee bit of concentration in class if I wasn't stimulated. Um, but I always wanted to achieve. Um, 
and I was always competitive. So even if I was in maths, which all accounting was my worst subject, but maths, let's say uh, if I was 18th in the class, I, I always wanted to be 17th, you know. So um, you know, I, I battled my way through school, had a lot of funny things happen there. Well, I, I caught up with a, a great teacher of mine uh, not long ago, and he, he reminded me of a, a story because we never used the, the children's toilets because they were dirty. Mm. And... Uh, nor, you know, likewise, if you got caught in the lift, you're in real stock. But caught having a number two in the teacher's toilets, mate, it's curtains, you know. And I was in there one day and, uh, you know, the door opens and I thought, oh, well, I'll just push off. And uh, they must have, you know, thought something was up. They Smelt said, something in the air. Thought. Well, they said, uh, you know, who is it? And I went, Cormac. And the deepest, and Cormac was this guy who was about 200 kilos. And uh, the voice didn't have the timber in it, it, it didn't resonate, and, I, and he was hanging around outside, and I thought, ah, oh, I'm poked. But I always wore two jerseys, so you had your first uh, team jersey, which was a black one, and then you had your, I always wore a second jersey, because it was freezing in Wellington, which was the stock standard school grey jersey. So I took my black jersey off, and I put it in a bag, and I threw it out the window, and it was fifth floor up, and it cleaned out a third floor, like, boom. <laughs> And then I pulled my jersey over my head and I came out and I pushed the teacher back into the window and then I bolted. And he cha- and there was a guy, Ross Durant, who used to play for uh, New Zealand in soccer and he knew I was the only one in the school who had got all away from him. And we went up and down and up and down and around and I got out and he came into the, uh, uh, the, the teacher's you know, lunchroom and said, that fucking Ellis. And, and the, a few, I had a few teachers on my side who were going, you bloody beauty, and a few who were going, yeah, well, he's a dreadful boy. And... Uh, my teacher just told me about that again the other day and reminded me that he came in <laughs> blue, you know, steam coming out of his ears. So I think I was, you know, probably a bit of a shit stirrer, but uh, also tried pretty hard. Yeah. And were you a sporty kid as well at school? Did you play everything under the sun to, um, a, to a high level? Yeah, yeah, gave everything a crack. I was ca- I captained the first 11 cricket, which was sort of my first passion, and then um, played first 15 footy for a few years and had a crack at the, the sprints and cricket ball throw and all those sort of you know, give, give everything a go, really. We Just had um, Melody Robinson on the show a couple of weeks ago. Ah, yeah, and, yeah. And she was talking about her days in Dunedin and Otago University, and your name came up. Oh, dear. And she said uh, Mark was, was like the king of uni. You know, uh, a guy who was good at every sport. He was life of the party. He was a good-looking... It was kind of everyone <laughs> looked up to Mark Ellis. Is that how you remember the Otago Uni days? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I don't remember the university days at all. I mean, it was too much of this, you know. I mean, it was. Uh, it did take me five years to get a three-year degree. So uh, I think I got the balance just about right. I mean, if I'd got the degree in three years, I'd have had to have left, you know, and uh, that would have been an absolute waste of two years. So the fact that it took five years to get the degree was uh, just perfect. And all of my mates, actually, the extended group, including Ben, we all took five years, so we all graduated at the same time. I think we were just having such a wonderful time down there. It was a pretty, you know, footloose and fancy free. Cause a bit of trouble, but do so with a, you know, a bit of integrity. And uh, there was n- never any nasty stuff happening. It was just high-spirited pranks. The way you romanticised your time at Otago University through sports cafe and stuff like that, like, I was just mesmerised by it. And I wanted my university experience to be exactly the same as what the way that you pictured it, which it kind of was... But do you look back at uni- or do you look at university now and think, man, you guys have got it all wrong? Have you been in the university recently or seen like what O-Week shenanigans are like compared um, to what they might have been like in the uh, good old days? I, I think the problem you get is when you get a grey-haired uh, bunch of board members making decisions for the betterment of the financial box, you know, and it's just like so predict- predictable. When they sold the Guardies, we tried to buy it, and uh, I remember that it was uh, two thousand and eight. Had a valuation of a million bucks, and when they heard we were on it and we'd got it underwritten by the breweries, and we were going to sell shares, a thousand shares for a thousand bucks each, so that we had a thousand shareholders coming to get a return on investment by spending the money at the pub, you know. And we, then we we're going to sell the bricks within the pub, you know, so you could put your degree and when you, and just turn it into this sort of uh, homage to those who had been, you know, our parents, our parents' parents, just have some real, you know, depth to it. Um, and the university did that because they wanted to sanitise university and create an environment which was more compelling to the international student because they paid more. What did it do? It just drove a splinter groups. A thousand students ended up, instead of going to a pub, to a hundred different flats, which is impossible to control. And all the international students went, you know, this looks fucking boring now. And so their, their role actually dropped. So, 
yeah, great, great. Never have a bloody accountant make your decisions on a board, and you know, students have a have a voice for yourself. You know, not you know, student union and all. I mean, Grant Robinson apparently was our, our head of the university. I didn't know that until about six months ago. That's how much of an impact they made back then. It was just like a fringe element. So actually, get some of the students in there having a bloody natter and making positive change. Yeah, you do. Uh, Shay is right. You, you, there's such a strong correlation with Mark Ellis and sort of Scarfy culture and university and romanticising that. We've had so many guests on who talk about the importance of that camaraderie coming through and how those were the most happy days of their lives or their sporting careers. Josh Cronfeld, I think, said yeah. that those were the most, that his favourite days, you know, he went on All Black and all these great things. It was those Otago days. Is that yeah. similar to you? Yeah, well, I mean, from a, a footy perspective, it was incredible back then because we were, you know, uh, students and there's what is it three, three and a half or eighteen thousand students in three and a half square kilometers and the police don't come in and the, the you know and if they do you burn something and then the fire brigade <laughs> takes precedence so they have to back off you know <laughs> yeah, so, so we knew the rules pretty well like we used to have a party on gore place and you know eventually to get shut down by noise control and the police you know would be there and then you'd light a car on fire so we'd buy an empty <laughs> car and that'd go up, and then the police would have to back off, and then the fire brigade would come in. I don't know whether the students know these sort of. We bought a fire engine in the end, you know, <laughs> at, a, at an auction, and uh, we did it so we could uh, actually, you know, try and spade the girls who we liked, you know. So we'd you know, go charging into flats and say, uh, just doing a uh, an alarm inspection. <laughs> and then if you got got into the room of the, which might sound a bit pervy by today's standards, but it was so bloody innocent, just a way to. You know, refine the odds of you bumping into the person that you really Amazing. liked. Yeah. Um, but you'd go in there, you'd read what the schedule was for, her, you know, her uh, shoots, you know, or lectures, so that you could actually, quite coincidentally, sort of be uh, sort of there or thereabouts when they came out of the lecture. Which you had to do because well, we didn't have phones and you couldn't text people or exactly. drop a pin where you were. You no, had to come, no. up, come up with ideas. Creative ways. And uh, so I'd like to think we, uh, you know, made uh, university a safer place and, you know, certainly. Uh, Made the odds be better in, in one or two of the boys' favours. Also, also spading is a word I haven't yeah, heard for a, long, for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Did I just mention spading? Yeah, you did. Oh, yeah, yeah. You were spading a girl. I was like, yeah, well, that's, that's right. We, that's uh, what we used to do. Yeah, yeah. Spade work. Yeah. So it's, you know, you, you've got to... Yeah, dig the groundwork. Exactly. Play, playing rugby for Otago in the 90s, I imagine, would be very different from a professional playing rugby for Otago now. Do you think you would enjoy the professional era as much as you did back then when it was court sessions and alcohol and, and camaraderie and all that sort of well, thing? Well, I got, I got lucky. I got started five years of amateur and five years of professional, and uh, the amateur years were by far and away the most uh, rewarding and enjoyable. I mean, you were playing at, at Carisbrook. There were 30,000 people there. There were students burning couches. You know, you'd go out there an hour before the game, and there'd be a gentle murmur and maybe 5,000 people, and then you'd come running out, and it would just be... Wah! And, you know, I remember playing one game, and this dude came tearing across the field doing a streak, and I went, ah, oh, shit. And it was Woody, the guy who I sent in <laughs> to check on the guy's foot, the <laughs> wire or farmer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's going, get out, boy! You know, and tearing past. And you know, people, oh, you shouldn't streak. Well, made us laugh, made the crowd roar, you know. But it's what they talk about with a beer afterwards over the, uh, you know, over the bar. But uh, they were incredible and fun, fun times. And we were doing it for the right reasons, which was to represent your uh, province and to earn a blazer and, uh, you know, or a tie first and then the blazer. And then feel like you're a part of a team, and 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 uh, you know if you lost, you got a pat on the back, and if you won, you got a pat on the back. Whereas when it got professional, in the end, I retired when I was only 28, I think, and uh, I just had enough of the, you know, there was a professional here who was going to tell you about, uh, you know, let's sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one psychology session, and you know Pete, who was our psychologist, and then even we used to have some amazing chats because we'd just sit there and he'd, what do you want to talk about, Mark? You know, and we'd say, well, what about uh, and we'd come up with you know weird and wonderful and perverted things, and uh, we'd sit sit there and chat away because, and then you had somebody who'd give you a video analysis session. You have to go down there. I know where I've fucked up and where I've gone all right. I don't need to see it replayed. And then you had you know skill sessions and stretching sessions, and it became a job, and it became everyone trying to prove their worth within the environment. Now it must be that on steroids. So. Yeah. I felt incredibly blessed, like Josh was saying, to have got those amateur days when you were doing it just for, for pride and we managed to go right against the Lions and Springboks and 
yeah. they, they were amazing, amazing times. Because not only did you, sorry, did you, did you do it domestically, but you lived in, well, you played in the era of All Black Tours as well, where you would go, out, go offshore and, and yeah. have dirt trackers and, yeah. and have all of those things as well, which now don't exist. I mean, they must have been the best of times too. Oh, incredible times. Inc- incredible times. I remember a, uh, one uh, in 1992, we went to South Africa and um, we were in the DDs, the Dirty DDs, and so the test side's playing and we got sent out on a commando mission where we were going to go and shoot some Springbok, you know. And we went to this big braai, you know, and we're going to have some sausage and some meat and like that. And uh, we're all sitting there and there's a guy who's about the same size as Mark Coxley, like he's seven foot tall. And he comes out and he, he torpedoes a can. He said, <laughs> Has anyone seen one of them? He went, no, mate. He went, Christ, how do you do it? And it's a, a bit like this. And we woof and just did it about <laughs> half the time. And he was so embarrassed. And he was like a big walkie just cru- cruising around. And every like three of those, I'd say, I just need a leak and go <laughs> around the back. And in the end, he literally toppled into the embers of the fire. And that was, you know, so we had all of those fun experiences. And then trying to line up a, you know, a spring block when your eyes are crossed and you're shaking. We had wonderful times on tour, you know, just uh, in, in the camaraderie that you built up and uh, the, the fun that you had on a six or an eight week tour, just incredible. Did you get brought down by Susie in 95? Were you? Yeah, I was the first to go down actually. Laurie yeah. Mainsley thought that I'd spread it. He said, right, banish me to the far end of the bloody, far end of the hotel. But uh, Was that just I, punishment for six tries that you scored against Japan and not passing the ball <laughs> he, to your teammates? He wasn't particularly happy with that, and, uh, but I might die with that one. It's getting harder, isn't it? You know, Japan beat the Springboks last time. <laughs> <laughs> and my son's watching it. I said, oh, they? No. Yeah, they're not a bad side, Japan, sir. <laughs> they're bloody awful when we played against them. I've um, heard, I'd, sorry, I've, I've heard that sort of as a rumour that he was pissed off with you for scoring so many tries that he told you to pass more. Is that accurate? Yeah, you know, it's ac- accurate. Absolutely. I mean, there are a couple I could have flicked out for sure. But I'd read the programme and I'd worked and, and it said that the record was five. <laughs> And so it was in the back of my mind, if I'm to be completely honest. <laughs> so I thought, well, oh, I might just throw a dummy here and have a little nudge. But, uh, I think you will die with that record, by the way. Well, it, it'll be hard, hard to beat unless, unless we uh, play a particularly poor, you know, pre-season, you know, island side or something <laughs> like that, you know, like a Fiji who's, you know... Yeah, really battling. Really haven't... haven't not, not at the end of the season, early in the season, but who knows. Yeah. I'm getting a bit excited. I'm jumping all over the place. Yes, but, uh, yes. the, the I su- keep forgetting the question you are, and I keep answering the wrong question. No, we're, good. We're, we're jumping around. But the Susie thing, you were the first to go down, yeah, that's and, right. and then everyone else eventually, well, most of them. I reckon down, we so. got Jim Eden the fruit. Like there's a fruit bowl, bowl in, 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 in the room, and I reckon they injected something into that because there's just no way that we could have possibly, uh, you know, had zero. But we had five people the entire tour who got croc in one shape, way, shape, or form. And then all of a sudden, before the main game, there was something like 23 out of 32 went down. And it was horrible. It was like, and because I got it first, I came right probably half a day earlier. Um, at, but I was feeling bloody awful um, when y- y- everyone was, but they must have been feeling even worse, you know, when we played the final. And we said, oh, no, no, we're not going to tell anyone about it. We'll just win the game and then, uh, then we can tell them about it. So there's probably a bit of naivety and a bit of arrogance there. We should have just said, no, mate, we've been poisoned. Check our, check our bloods. We're not playing. Did the fruit thing, I mean, I'm imagining you're all doing your little investigations afterwards thinking, fuck, what could it have been? Did you pair it up like, oh, everyone that had the fruit was sick? Like, were you thinking like that? Well, it was it's something in the team room because the only guys who didn't get crock are the guys who went out and snuck out for uh, McDonald's. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> I think Walter Little and Johnny Timu, uh, not Johnny Timu, um, he wasn't there. Uh, Walter Little and a few of the Brown brothers went, went out for, uh, for a feed and they, they didn't cop it. But everyone else had, and some people had different things at dinner. So unless, I, I just thought it was the fruit because after training you'd come in and have a, some fruit. Yeah. Pretty easy to inject. Yeah. John Timu is a good name too, by the way, throwing that out there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's a wonderful man, JT. <laughs> Um, uh, you always knew when he'd had a big night because you'd come home and there'd be a beanbag hanging on his uh, flat outside the flat because his, wi- his wife to be wouldn't let him stay in the bed because he was a bit of a fire truck. <laughs> 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 and so you'd come driving past, and go, oh, fucking T Bone's had a big one. Hey, check that out. You know, there'd be like a beanbag hanging up on the clothesline. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> oh, fuck <it's> <laughs> 
Oh, oh you might have to edit that one out. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'll leave that one out. He won't listen. Yeah. He was flatting with Aaron Penne, I remember, and we the, the first time we made the university side, which was that was the, my favourite side, almost above Otago. We had a like a a, a bit of a, a a session, and we we went down to their place, and Aaron said, "Right, everyone nude." And so we go, oh, shit, okay, fair enough. The Incredible Hulk's told us all to get nude, so we got nude. And then JT <laughs> came out with the golf club and smashed his own TV to pieces. <laughs> and then we had to run through the middle of Varsity and climb down a ladder and dip your balls in the leaf. <laughs> <laughs> like that. That was like part of the bonding, you know. So, I mean, it was incredibly uh, embarrassing, you know. And uh, not only that, but, you know, the leaf's not warm. Oh, I've always got and, that. And, uh, you, you, you know, so you, you, you're really sprinting on the way back, you know. <laughs> I've, always, I've always said you dip your plums in, in the middle of the octagon is, is how I've retold your story but I'm, I've got it now that it's the leaf it's the leaf it's okay. high risk because if you slip in there and it's a torrent you could end up in the bloody uh, in the harbour okay? <laughs> everyone made it back Aaron Pena who uh, owns a Spates Ale House down in Hamilton pardon Aaron, Aaron Pena yeah, who owns who owns the Spates yeah, yeah who owns the, yeah. Uh, the Spates Ale House nice. wonderful man and he was uh, you know not quite that wonderful back then <laughs> um, he got you <laughs> one of the fascinating parts of your journey and there's many of them is your move to the Warriors so you're 25 26 you're an all black you're a stud one of the hottest properties in the game and then this is before the professional era and am I right in thinking that the move to the Warriors was in part because you got a marketing job at KPMG yeah well I'd finished my degree sadly after the five years of you know bumbling my way through and we started Charlie's when we were still sort of playing so it was like uh you know let's have a crack we we grew up in Wellington there was a company that Stefan's orange juice but Stefan was a Catholic and then we had the Hoggards and they did the daily squeeze and and so we knew what real orange juice was it was squeezed nothing added nothing taken away got three days to drink it and that wasn't happening in Auckland. So all of the you know beautiful restaurants around town were getting you know stuff made with concentrate and fruit pulp and wazos and you know sugars added and all of the, all of this stuff. And it just tastes different, you know. And uh, so we thought, you know, off the back of Left Field, which was a bar that we'd set up down the waterfront with Kevin Roberts and uh, Jeff Valletta, a couple of you know marketing gurus and Rick Salitza and guys like that. There was a little you know. A squab off the back and we turned that into a fruit food processing area and we had a made a machine to ream the juice and we started by owning the viaduct all the cafes around there and then we had charlie's angels go around because we were in our late 20s so we had these beautiful girls going around with the trays while they're building uh shed you know ship wharf 19 or shed yeah. 19 and we had the, the all the builders tra trained like pavlov's dogs like at 10 o'clock in the morning they'd be right it's orange <laughs> juice time and the girls would come out and hand them out orange juice and say they were Looking bloody good by the time they'd finished the building. Yeah. But we owned the viaduct and then we decided to go into Ponsonby and then we went over and met a, a guy called Gino Vasio who was a part of the you know, the Greek mafia who owns uh, you know, Mildura and Melbourne uh, and Stefan had dealt with him and everyone thought he was Stefan was involved with the mafia, but he wasn't, he's Polish. Um, and anyhow we bought these machines back and so we put them into the supermarkets around New Zealand, about thirty machines into thirty supermarkets and Hugh Perrett from uh, Foodstuffs, uh, who knew my old man, gave us a meeting and said, yep, we'll make the investment to put these in, because we said it's a sensory experience, so you can see it, smell it, hear, hear it and taste it, and, and, and it creates that impression of fresh in the supermarkets, and that worked. And then we packed it, and uh, off the back of a relationship with Peter Keane from Lion Breweries, which is why I'm... You know, hoping we can blur the <laughs> 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 my Steinlager mate, who was our brewery liaison officer at Otago Rugby. He gave us an opportunity to uh, tag along with Steinlager. So if you bought 24 pallets of Steinlager, you got a free pallet of Charlie's. And so we they did our distribution, and we went from zero to number one overnight. So Kinos, cheers, mate. Yeah. <laughs> you know, without that break, uh, without many breaks, actually, Charlie's wouldn't have. You know, made it to where it, where it got to. Yeah, how much of the early success is down to the clever marketing and your profile? Like, I, I think Stefan's a, a, a smart dude, right? Like, he's commercially the smartest in the room. And uh, he, I think, saw my value where I didn't want to contemplate it. Um, but I was always uh, quite keen to have a crack at something, do something different, you know? So we sponsored the Home Show, for example, 
which was the first FMCG brand to do so when big car brands, international car brands, were doing it after he called Kofi Annan a cheeky darky. That's right. Yeah, they pulled out, right? So you yeah, and we them. changed the ad every day. We filmed a different ad every single day. And so Charlie's today, Holmes is brought to you by F. F means fresh. Fresh is what Charlie's is all about. And so so we bookended the, the top and tail of the show. So we tried new stuff, and in doing that, we then got from uh, uh, foodstuffs into progressive uh and um, it sort of grew legs and rolled out. There's three of you that have founded this company, and like the, what you're just saying about it's kind of building and snowballing year after year. Was there real? I've heard you say like when you first started it, you wanted it to be a hundred million dollar company. Like, was there feeling of excitement that it was happening? Like, do you remember? Yeah, look, the, 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 the formative years, sort of like a target rugby, the, you know, the, the, the formative years were just so much fun. You had uh, my best mate, uh, Simon, Stefan, who's a guy I love to bits, and, uh, you know, who despite being a Catholic, you know, and us doing this at school and throwing bloody custard squares at their buses when they passed and, you know, having, having a lot of uh, inter-college rivalry. Um, he, he's just a, a, a wonderful guy. So the three of us working together, we were laughing every day. And we were saying, well, why can't we do this? And why shouldn't we do this? And we had sort of Stefan's commercial acumen to say, well, look, look, this might be the right approach. And my sort of zany, you know, marketing or contemplative uh, promotional ideas and with the basics of having a marketing degree, so you kind of understand roughly what you need to be doing. And then Simon, who's just the doer. So we were a, a bit of a hip team, you know, and we loved each other's company and, you know, we had the balance right. I remember the old man coming into. Uh, our, uh, and we'd, we'd just got a contract or I think we'd just got Progressive on board and he came in with a bottle of champagne and he said, boys, the one bit of advice I've got to give you is you've got to slow down and you've got to celebrate your victories. Because we weren't, we were just going, yeah, you know, keep on going forward. But he actually made us, and I've never forgotten that. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, taking time to celebrate your victories, however big or small they are, if they mean something to you, doff your hat and, and don't be afraid to doff it to yourself, you yeah. know. I'm, I'm big on that too. That's great. When, uh, it was like 10 years that after you sold? Was it 11 years? 11 years. 11 yeah. years. Um, the decision to sell, like getting out of the game, how hard was that? How did that come about? Oh, very easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we the, it was just the perfect timing, really. I mean, we had Keno, my mate from the breweries. He was the underbidder. So uh, Lion Breweries were keen to take us out. Um, and so too, then Asahi came along and um, they, they, it's always good to have two in the room. And uh, then Stefan, because he's just such a, uh, he's a ballsy dude. And uh, I don't know what we sold for, $1.44 or something like that. And and we listed it uh, 20 cents. So anyone who stayed on the journey with Charlie's got a bloody good return. So we were incredibly proud of that because there's a lot of companies who list and, uh, you know, and, and, and dump. We might have been, it, it doesn't matter. It was a good return if you hung in there. And, and sort of list, take their money off the table as, as shareholders and directors and leave the mums and dads who came along for the ride in the stock, you know. But he just couldn't resist. I think we had a, an offer of, a, let's say, a thirty, going and eyeballing Asahi and saying, nah, not enough. And so he got another 14 cents, which I think equated to a million dollars, you know. So <laughs> it just, but it was, for him, the thrill of the chase, you know. And uh, he didn't tell us till he got back. Yeah. And uh, he told us, we went, Man, you could have blown that. Oh, I want because I wondered if you were hands on with the negotiation as well. Or no, not you? with the negotiation. I was, I was a director, but uh, the negotiation was uh, Stefan was CEO and uh, Ted Van Arkel was our, our chairman. So I think between the pair of them, they did the you know the heavy lifting. And how did you feel about it all being so public? I mean, it was big news. Everyone knew how it was like eighteen million or something you got from it, and it was everywhere. Like, did that change people's your relationship with people? Did people treat you differently? Nah. Not really. I've, I've been always quite lucky that um, even when I was playing sport toward the end, people didn't really know who you were when you're playing sport. They knew who you were in Dunedin because we were all a family in Dunedin. Like it's a, it, the further south you go, I think the better people get because they've got more time for you because they've got less, you know, superfluous bullshit going on. You know. So if you've, uh, sorry, I've forgotten the. The, the, the it, it, just of. just a relationship with money when people it's so public about oh, yeah, how much yeah. money you've yeah you've yeah so, so um but then once you start doing tv everyone fucking knew who you were because tv was there's only a few channels and uh you know there, there were only 
you know, two opportunities at seven o'clock at night or whenever the hell we, we did our thing. Um, but so if we went away on a rugby trip, for instance, everyone would be hounding Jeff Wilson because well, what's Jeff Wilson like? We want to know what he's like. And everyone would go, g'day, Macca, how you going, bro? <laughs> so they sort of knew what I was like, so I got none of that hassle. And uh, I, I think, you know, well, nobody's ever given me a hard time or, or, or but and a few have said, oh, congratulations, but, uh, you know, they're probably a bit closer to the action than, than not, really. I don't think anyone gives a toss. You know, I certainly don't. But it's a byproduct of having fun money, you know, and it's a fun ticket. Yeah. If you got, if you don't, what are you going to do, die with it? You know, yeah. you ever, this is the thing that pisses me off in New Zealand big time, right? Is, uh, you know, we, we uh, have this uh, perception that money buys you happiness, you know, and so you need to have the latest iWatch or you're your poked or the latest iPhone. But, you know, when you take your last breath, you're not going to give a damn about how much money you had in the bank or what car you drove or where your house was positioned or where you lived or what trips you went on. It's how much time did you spend with the people you loved. And who does that better than anyone? Maori and Polynesian. So why aren't we celebrating Maori and Polynesian culture as being much richer than Anglo-Saxon culture, although I may have found my whakapapa. Anglo-Saxon culture where, you know, you have a, a nuclear family of two and they take off overseas and they don't keep in touch with their cousins and they come back for Christmases together. Where's wealth? Where does it lie? Marion Tolaga Bay rows the dinghy out and comes back to Mariah. That's where joy and... But they've been told by the media that that's you, you're losing because you don't have the latest iPhone and you need this. So they've created this... I really, that pisses me off. Mm. I think it's, a, it's been badly sold. Have you learned that later in life? Like, no, I've always had that opinion. Always. I think people who chase money, really want money, think it's really important, you'll never get it. It's an illusion. If, 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 you, if you, you know, sample of one, one man's humble opinion. You know, doesn't, you know there'll be lots of people who think I'm, that, that I'm wrong. So that's what I think. No, I don't think. Yeah, well, well I, I agree. It's interesting as well because we had Grant Fox come in and say, how do you spell love? And he spells love, T-I-M-E, time, yeah. spending time with people. And, I, and yeah. I feel like we're only kind of halfway through, but hearing about your latest chapter in terms of being a dad and spending time with your kids, that kind of those two ideas mesh up, right? That you've yep. you had these chapters of life and then you thought, fuck, this is now the most important chapter is to spend time with my kids. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, haven't, haven't always got it right, that's for sure. We, when we were planning on how we were going to do this episode, it was like there's, there's three parts of your story which on their own could make whole episodes, right? You've got, like we've already talked about, you've got your rugby, you've got your business, and you've got your TV. But when we're breaking down this timeline, the fascinating thing is like so many of these three things were all happening at the same time. Like the move to the Warriors, being on Sports Cafe and Charlie's, like that was all swirling around in those same few years, right? Mid twenties. Yeah, within reason. I mean, Charlie started at twenty twenty eight. Um, TV started first year at the Warriors. Um, what was the other one? <laughs> Sport. <laughs> Sport. Oh, that yeah. was that was all ongoing. You know? <laughs> yeah. you know? That was ongoing until it was. I mean, I remember getting offered to go to Harlequins and and play. Earl Curtin set it up, and uh, that would have been wonderful. I'd have loved that because that was sort of the university rah rah in London, and I reckon it would have suited me down to the ground. I'd have fitted in quite nicely over there. And it was decent money. It was like, uh, you know, big money. And, but I could make the same money doing TV here and playing for North Harbour. So, well, why would I rock the boat? I should have done it. That's a mistake. But I'd have never had the TV career that I had, you know. So, it's like sliding doors. You know, it's, yeah. It's, it, I'd, you'd like to live a few lives. <laughs> Just before we get to the TV, I'm really excited to get to that. But, but the Warriors. Yep. Two seasons there. Three. Three seasons there. Yep. Uh, how do you reflect on that time? Like that was a, a huge move, like move it. Oh, look, like it was uh, as I said uh, earlier. You know, I'd finished my five years at uh, university and uh, thought, well, um, you know, where to from here? You know, I've got to leave for commercial opportunity. I've got to go to Auckland. I don't want to play rugby for Auckland against my old mates at Otago. So, and then this came along, and of course, you had the uh, a sign-on fee, which was tax-free. So you, you try and bolster that as high as you can. But it was at the same time that we were negotiating with Murdoch, I think it was, for uh, the rugby. And, and I remember uh, Jonah was paid an astronomical amount and everyone else was paid, I think, 300, 350 grand. And uh, because I had nothing to lose, I, I went back to them and said, nah, it's not enough, mate. You know? And, uh, the, book and so of, the book of I was, I, was, I was second, I was paid second behind Jonah on the, on the table offer, you know? 
<laughs> it was just after the six tries. It was just because I was a cheeky little shit having a go. And, uh, but everyone else was going, yeah, this is bloody incredible. But it, it, I'd already signed for the Warriors and, uh, um, you know, so I signed on there. Had a cracking first year. Loved it. John Maney was our coach. And cracking first touch. Didn't you score a length of the field with your first touch in a yeah, preseason game? Yeah, that was, that was, a, that was a, a pretty pretty nice start. And then uh, I remember saying to John Maney at the end of the first season, mate, what am I doing right or wrong? He said, you're going all right, just don't go for the fucking sideline. Because you know, in rugby, the sideline's your friend. It's certainly not in the league. And you're one of the last, I think, All Blacks to become Kiwis as well. I don't think there's that many after you. There's some that have done it the other way around. Brad Thorne did it the other way around. Mm. He was a Kiwi that Which became... Sonny Bilgo. He went Kiwis All Blacks. Kiwis All Blacks. Yeah, they did it pretty well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot harder going the other way. Uh. <laughs> is, it is it? Is it harder going the other way? I, All I, jokes I, aside? Well, I, I think they tend to be pretty uh, solid fellas in, in league, you know. And uh, the, the big difference for me was I hadn't played it. And so, and because I didn't say of Moni, hey, mate, where do I need to be? I, I probably should have been more eager to learn. And I just actually backed myself, said, I'll be, I'll be right. You know, in first year, it was right. Second year, it, you know, wasn't quite as right as the first year. And it became a bit political in the third year. And, you know, so, because I had a five year five-year contract. It was a three-year contract with the right of renewal on us, which my old man slipped in at the last minute when we were signing it. So after three, two and a half, two years, I got put in reserve grade, and I said, oh, mate, this is sweet, you know, going down to play uh, uh, Hawke's Bay, you know, <laughs> playing reserve grade, played Wellington. That was one of the hardest games of league I've ever had because they were just going, oh, you little Wellington college arsehole, oh, they're all Wainui boys, oh, whoa! And it was reserve grade, and it was horrific. Um, but I, I said, oh, thanks, guys. I'm going to sign up for another two years. I'm really enjoying this. And that's when they paid me out for my last year. So, well, paid me out for the last two years to get rid of me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so it ended up being quite a good commercial decision. But I, I think I probably should have sought a bit more advice as to what I was doing right and wrong because the angles are very, very different. On attack, I'd find myself, you know, trying to sprint to get on the end of a move. And then Gene Namu would flick it back in. I'm going, oh, for fuck's sake. And I was one of the fittest in the team. So I was, but I'd burn so much energy off the ball trying to get there to be in the right spot at the right time. So I think it's about angles, both defensively and offensively. Whereas, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know about going the other way, but, you know, they've done a cracking job. Those last two guys you mentioned, <laughs> haven't they, you know? Um, Gene Nam is a great name I hadn't heard in a long time. Yeah, Fuck, he was a yeah, great set of legs. He was, he was a wonderful. They, I, I, they, those Warriors guys were uh, just some of the most uh, beautiful men you'd come across. They were just solid, solid of the earth. And if you catch up with them now, we caught up with them uh, um, recently, and uh, it was a, a, a lovely night. You know, but you just get on so well with them; they're just solid, solid the earth. But before we leave uh, the rugby league scene, anyone that played in the Jonah era, I always ask if they've got a Jonah story. If if you've got something from playing with him or against him that that really stands out. Oh, my highlight was uh, in in his. First year, um, counties came down and he was like a beast, and he got a runaway. And I'm the only guy coming along, and uh, he was going down the sideline and managed to chop him at the at the shins, and you know, take him out in the touch. It was just like the best tackle of my life. That's on the upside. On the downside, when we're on tour as a reserve, I'd have to mark him on the wing, and uh, you know, at, at trainings he'd just beast you, you know, and he could run around you, he could step, and it's because he had such big levers that he'd move a big distance so the best you could get was one leg and then he's got the sort of strength to yank out of it almost or he could just go whoop and just go over the top so he was just extraordinary yeah. what sort of a f like specimen was he in the gym or were you not in the gym that much in those days no we weren't in the gym i, I remember going to the warriors and uh we had to do bench press and you had to do three uh, three of the most you could do and i could do three of 90 kilos and i was so embarrassed like gene nam did three of 120 and so I just, every day I'd come to the to, to training, I'd, I'd just do bench press, you know, and I eventually I got to 150. I could do one on 150, which was, uh, and then I tapped out and went, oh, well, you know, not as embarrassing as it was. Right back numbers, at the beginning. Those, those are really good numbers. Yeah, really oh, good numbers. Well, you know, it might not have come right down to the chest, I don't think. You know? <laughs> yeah. um, amazing. Thanks for sharing. But Jonah that. was, yeah, a freak. Amazing. Amazing player. Well, did you overlap with JK at the Warriors? Did he, or did yep. he go the and, year before? And, and in rugby as yeah. well. So he was my first roommate with the All Blacks in really? Christchurch. Yeah, for the 
um, World 15 or something in 1992. And, uh, like, and he said, oh, I'll toss you for the bed, like for the double bed. Or the single. I said, oh, okay, I'll smash the, the double. But that's the humility that went through. The All Blacks were so, you know, solid, you know. I, I think and a guy like JK is the best winger in the world saying, I'll toss you for the bed. I mean, if I'd won, he might have given me a hiding and said, no, nah, piss off. But I, I just, you know, didn't give him the chance to toss for it. Amazing names. I think, Mark, subconsciously when we started this podcast, we hoped one day we would have a guest like you telling these stories. And we haven't even got to our favourite bit yet. And I think more so talking about Sports Cafe. We've had on Rick Salito. We've oh, had yeah. on Lee Hart. Uh, it, it was just such a... Well, I think it's time for another beer. Yeah, this is going to go downhill. Crack open another one. <laughs> um, it was such a an important part of both me and Seamus's upbringing. Teenage boys, every week. TV2 Sports Cafe appointment viewing and you were a big part of that, well, maybe the biggest part because we didn't know what you were going to do every, every week. But I was wondering if you could just paint the story from the start. Like, was JK meant to front and then he pulled out last minute and then you substituted in? Is that how it started? Yeah, yeah I think so. I think, uh, you know, Rick did the typical Auckland thing and had Zinni and JK on. And uh, But we, Rick and I always got on really well. And uh, he had, he's got a quirky uh, sort of a sense of humour and uh, so we both liked that about one another. When he was a media liaison officer for the All Blacks, he used to get quite highly stressed. <laughs> and, you know, I'd be winding the hell out of him, you know. And so he was just, you know, I definitely got on his radar. Um, and when it started, uh, JK couldn't do it. And so he called me in and we went through the, it was out at Sky, went through the props cupboard and there was this heinous old suit. And, you know, just did a student thing and chucked a heinous suit on and asked, uh, you know, you know, stupid or daft questions really you know um i hated it when we got rugby players on because they were so boring you know mm. so i used to say to rick who we got on we got a you know we got uh simon we rootany you know like a, a skier ski jumper you know <laughs> that was got, an amazing episode by <laughs> was, was simon we rootany was incredible, incredible. Speak, incredible speaking of cannabis <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> uh he was he he was a bloody river um you know but anyone who was tweaky and from outside the normal realm of, yeah, yeah, she was a good go and blah, mm. blah, 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 which I can't have any value there, you know. But when there's something a little bit left field, you know, so Rick would always balance it up with some, you know, some strange stuff and some good stuff. What do you remember meeting Lee Hart the first time? Oh, we were mates from Varsity, right? So, uh, um, we're, and we were yarning away and I said, mate, yeah, we need to get this guy on the show. So there were three guys who were mates, four guys who were mates from university that Gimp, Ralph, my best mate, best man, uh, the ginger Aboriginal, um, the human cannibal, who uh, came on as uh, um, hard, and, hard and erect. Hard and erect. <laughs> yeah, over the Harbour Bridge. Hard and erect. Hard um, and erect. And uh, then there was Lee, who came on as a snail guy, snail racer originally, and uh, then just morphed into this, you know, sensation. And then the other guy was Trapper, who was a guy called Dave Simpson, Fat Legs. Who uh, who came on as a possum trapper, you know? And uh, we, you know, we just talked to him about, you know, how, how many have you culled, and you know, what's the problem? What does it do to the native bush, and all that sort of nonsense? Nothing to do with sport, you know. So, but he also had opinions on things because he was sort of the rural voice trapper. <laughs> and uh, he said to me the other day, actually, we were up at the uh, Grayland RSA. He said, "Mate, I had a guy come up to me and say, get a trapper the other day. He recognised me. He said, I, I the bloody voice, mate. I recognised it." So, you're a trapper, aren't you? And he, so he had to have a, a beer with this dude. Who, and he was only on for two shows. And then there was another guy who came and pulled his balls out and ran across the stage who was you know, going nameless because he's a very high-profile man. <laughs> <laughs> These days, he'd hate it. <laughs> you can tell us afterwards. Uh, yeah, I will. Um, so, yeah, that, the snail racing thing in particular with Lee, like what Lee has gone on to achieve is, is amazing. He's one of our favourite probably yeah, yeah, my yeah. favourite comedian in New Zealand. But, yeah. like, we've, we've played clips and we've had him talk about that. Did you realise there was magic happening in that very scene where he's the professional snail racer who's going overseas and he's smashing the snails and all that? Yeah, well, I, I got the snails out of my garden at home and ha bought them in in a, in a two-litre ice cream tub and, just, and he was wearing the brown and brown, and brown track suit and uh, he, he's just, his comic timing's brilliant, you know, and he's got, uh, he, he's... He and his, his mate Grease, uh, uh, Matt Johnson, who uh, played the drums yep. in the band, he he's he was he's a great mate, but when he 
says something you don't know whether he's being serious or not. Even as a mate of his, you go, uh, so yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? You know, you don't know whether he's taking the piss or whether he's actually meaning that it's incredible. So the two of them, having toured together in bands, you know, they, they had a, 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 a just a sense of humour that was, a, you know, a little bit different, and it's the it's the dry. I don't know, is he being serious or not? I mean, Lee's a little more obvious because he's dialed it up a bit, but Matt, you, you you still to this day don't know whether he's being serious or not. You've got to actually sort of work it out with a few mates. Is, is he taking the piss or not? You know. <laughs> One of uh, the best things about this is that I'm able to call up former guests and ask them about guests that are coming on. So I talked to Lee Hart for about 30 minutes yesterday. A little name drop there. But um, he told a story. He told two stories that I want you to talk about. Uh, the first one, he's like, oh, yeah, geez, we had some wild times back then. Um, after screening one one night, I think me and Mark got into a bare knuckle uh, fight. We had a, <laughs> we had yeah, a, we, we had a bunch up. We did. We had a bare knuckle fight. I don't know quite how that happened, but he was, he was a lot better than I thought he'd be. <laughs> he said he knocked your tooth out. No. <laughs> no, he didn't do that. I had, it, I had a wobbly tooth. I've had that since uh, I got knocked out, actually, when I was 19 by some guy in a pub in Wellington. Dreadful cheap shot. He was from Auckland. The other one mm-hmm. was, uh, and with all the cast of characters you've just mentioned, breaking into the America's Cup, the oh, Team New Zealand yeah, America's yeah. Cup village. That this was, was big news, that right? It wasn't good. And because we had the gimp, right, Ralph, with <laughs> us, and he was covered in spikes, you know, the, 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 <laughs> and he was rolling around in the sails. And like, I reckon he would have definitely perforated, I think it was one, one America. Yeah. And so somebody gave us a, like a boat. You it's know, a tiny little dinghy, wasn't it? Yeah, but it, but it had a horse uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. on the back of it, and it was so bloody flat. It was a duck shooting boat to go and collect the ducks, but it was camo that you could go under the wharves, and so we just shot under the wharves, and we ended up in one, you know, one true or whatever it was base, and the gimps rolling around with you know somebody in the bloody, and it it became a big issue. Like the prime minister was you know saying this is most embarrassing, and you know we we managed to negotiate that if we apologised. Uh, all would be good. And so Eva came out and said something in Bulgarian and we tried to interpret it, so it was just the ultimate ah, fuck you, you know. <laughs> Why do they take themselves so seriously? Is that the sign of a great bit when the Prime Minister's getting involved? Like you don't Oh it's you wonderful. Don't, you don't yeah. care about that stuff, right? So you're just like fucking the more the more Well, I used to encourage Helen Clark not to streak on nude day. She was the only <laughs> one who we didn't want to get nude, you know? Because, well, I mean you don't really have to say cause, do you? You know? It's all relatively apparent. Nude day itself. So that's pre-social media, pre-content capture days. I asked this of Rick. Like, quite high-standing people sending in VHS of them in various yeah, states well, sh- of Yeah, imagine life. doing a nude day now. Like, we, we, we actually did a world nude day many years thereafter. But you had the police, like, yeah. sending in clips. And so they've got to have somebody there with a video camera <laughs> yeah. filming it, you know? Giving someone a speeding ticket and yeah, a G-string. Somebody, yeah, it's just brilliant, you know? And it, it, it's, it appeals to Kiwi sensibility or, or, or irreverence, you know? It's like, you know, we, we do our job, but we've got to have some fun, you know? And, and, and so people are getting reprimanded and told off. I mean, heaven forbid what would happen to them now, you know? But it would be so much easier to film, wouldn't it? Yeah. Your, and your on-screen relationship with Lana always, to me, seemed quite frosty and was kind of a good point of tension. Yeah. Well, we, we, we um, I said to Rick, get Lana on, she'd be great, because, you know, I've always thought Lana was beautiful. You know, she was Miss Music. And uh, I, I, my first TV gig was when I was playing for Otago, and they said, right, you've, we'd like you to come and film a segment for something, but you're going to be staying in a snow cave with Lana. And so yeah, I couldn't have got there quick enough, you know? <laughs> You know, <laughs> and then I got there and I was staying in the snow cave alone, you know, and I said, oh, fucking false advertising, you assholes, you know. And so when when the one of the birds pulled out from uh, uh, Sports Girl, I said, get Lana on, she'd be great, because I knew you could, she'd have a bit of fun and we could play off there being a bit of chemistry, but, you know, and me always trying to push the envelope. And so it was, it was a sitcom, I and mean, that's what Rick did. He brought weird and, you know, silly people together and, made a sitcom with people who felt like your family rather than, you know, serious sport analytics or, you know. Uh, yeah, talk about the shirt is what Rick said. It was his kind of analogy that if you get someone yeah. on who's wearing a bright shirt but you're talking sport, don't worry about all of that stuff. Talk about what the guy's wearing. Like, talk about what's in the periphery or what's happening in and around yeah, it. Yeah, because people typically from sport get asked a very, you know, vanilla bunch of questions all the time. So they've got 
wrote answers for all of those. But if you go and say, whoop, you know, about your shirt or, you know, something a bit quirky, then it throws them off and then you get to the real them mm. and then you get the gold. A so like, A little bit like a podcast. Yeah, yeah. A little bit of, yeah, feed them some beers and, you know. <laughs> but you, you, you're so right about the chemistry, the tension with Lana and you have these weird oddball characters, the Gimp and the Cannonball and Lee Hart, but then you and Rick, almost like that, father-son relationship where he's trying to control the ship and you're doing everything you can to kind of derail it like, mm. was that by design were you getting in there and actually trying to like derail things? well that was a sort of role i played with him in the all blacks you know when he's media li- liaison officer and trying to keep the media away from laurie mains who was nicknamed funeral face you know and and there and so rick's always stressed he's always under pressure and so you just try and go to him and wind him up even more you wanted him to pop and so I just did exactly the same thing on Sports Cafe, you know. It was, uh, it was his show. He was really, you know, proud of it and nervous of it and worried about it and happy for it and excited. And then you just try and just stir him up and, you know, annoy him. It, yeah. was, it was incredible. I mean, you got paid good money to drink a few beers and take the mick. But did, but did things on the show sometimes, when you, did, when you were pushing the boundaries, did, that, did, you, did you stress on those things? And, yeah, well, and you, you, I mean, because it was live, you would... Uh, uh, it was like playing a game. You couldn't de-escalate afterwards. So you'd go home and you'd feel alive, you know, because you've got all that energy. And, and so sometimes you'd be going over it in your mind. And I think it would probably be harder at my age, which is probably why Rick hated the stock, because you can't just go, ah, pff, water off duck's back. You probably overanalyze and contemplate and it might play havoc with his sleep. Um, but, you know, you used to just dump it. But it did take a couple of hours to, you know, relax and, and do so. That, that, that was your superpower, though, too, because you're a professional rugby player at this point. You've gone back to rugby. And this TV thing is kind of like a side hustle, right? So like mm. people that are in TV, they take it very seriously and they're worried about career and what it means. But you didn't give a shit about any of that because this was kind of on the side? Well, we worked, yeah, we worked out uh, early on that uh, TV people are very serious about TV. It's, it's like uh, they're saving the fucking world, right? You know, and they all take themselves, you know, they all believe that. And so we worked out that you're not saving the world. And if we tell you no, you'll pay us more. Right? So the more we said no, the more desperately they wanted you because they couldn't understand why you'd say no. Because this is it. This is everything. That's fucking New Zealand, mate. You know? yeah. And it's not everything because you know, if I finish doing this one day, even if I have a really long career, I can't retire off it. You know? it's, it's, so stop taking yourself so seriously. So when you ride the wave, Ridgie and I got this better than anyone so we were taking the piss right from the outset you know because you guys owned tv for a little period of time <laughs> yeah. there like you were almost every show oh we, we, we it was funny i like we, you know we we got quite good at hustling right now because we just said no nah, fuck off we're not doing it today you know and so and then somebody would come along and pay you five grand to wear a t-shirt for the night you know it was just like it was absurd yeah. <laughs> it was absolutely obscene <laughs> and the more you said no the more, the more they wanted you it was so we were just laughing. And then, like, Reggie and I getting flown around the world, and we said to Julie, Chrissy, no, we're not fucking going economy. No, no, no. So we're in the, we, we, we were getting over business class, first class on the taxpayer tit. And, uh, you know, better that than the bloody politicians, I say. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so we were going to these amazing places like Rio de Janeiro, and we're staying in five-star hotels. And, some, and, and even in London, Reggie and I, because we'd roomed together playing sport, they'd say, well, we've got this place here and we'd say oh we're not staying there we'd pull out of the hotel combine our money and go and stay in mayfair at this hotel overlooking hyde park you know and but we were rooming together that was the only downside but hey you know so it was it was an absolute mick take really yeah and uh that made us laugh and uh you could never take it too seriously and the, I, the best joke was always on yourself so we you know that's where we laughed the most I love the thought of you and Ridgie saying, yeah, just, just keep saying no. They're just going to keep giving us fucking shit. Yeah, well, he's a, no. Ridgie's streetwise, man. You can't kill him. You know, he <laughs> will always survive. And he, he, he worked it out. And so he, he got a bad reputation. There were some directors who wouldn't work with us because he'd say, oh, for fuck's sake, what's taking so long? You know, what, what's going on here, pricks? You know, and, and they're having to set up cameras and, you know, do things and film it two or three times. He's like, hey, I'm out of here. And he'd take off. He'd drive off. He'd actually drive. And, and say, well, it's in the can. Uh, that, that takes fine. And he'd never do two or three takes. And so, wow. and, and I'm just going, oh, 
yeah, hey, tell him you're exactly right, mate. This guy's, <laughs> this guy's taking the piss. He's trying to, he's trying to get the uh, duty to pay him a full day instead of a half day, you know. And so then wind Ridge up, and then he'd explode. And then I'd say, look, he's an asshole to the, to the crew, you know. So <laughs> play both sides. <laughs> yeah, it was so much fun. So in that in that case, the walkout for the game of two halves episode with him and Sally. <laughs> Yeah, with the the haircut and the teeth was that yeah. was that legit? Because that's one of the oh no, he, he just said ah, you know he actually doesn't care. He always said, you know, who gives a fuck what they say? And I said I give a fuck what they all say, you know. And so that was our key difference was he didn't care about what anyone thought. I cared about what everyone thought, you know. And so uh, that that worked quite nicely together. But he's a survivor. He's confident in his own skin, and he got pissed off. So he said, oh, fuck you, I'm out of here. Because that's for, off. for anyone not familiar with it, it's a clip of Matthew and his then wife Sally, <laughs> <laughs> and his response to an answer wasn't particularly articulate. No, no, it wasn't, and it was just after he'd had his teeth done because he was an ugly guy until he did his teeth, and, and then he became quite a, quite he, a handsome man. Did he man, actually he? have the teeth done? Because that's, that's well, he had the pegs, he had the little sticks, you know, and he got the beautiful, you know, American veneers. First guy in the world, pretty much. <laughs> Unbelievable, <laughs> even while he was playing. And they were as wide as that bloody wall and perfect. Yeah. Right? But beforehand, he looked like, uh, you know, a, a gremlin when it gets wet. <laughs> hey. hey. <laughs> <laughs> and then Toddy's got the big mullet. Yeah. So, I mean, so good. Oh. It was, it's, it's good TV. We'll have, to, uh, we'll have to bring that clip out because yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's one oh, of the play greatest. Play it again, Toddy. Yeah. Play it again. I think we will. Um, <laughs> The right, so, so as you're getting this TV stardom and you're getting whatever you want, how did that, had you retired at this point? Or did that, did that force an early retirement, how well you're doing TV? Wise? Yeah, it certainly didn't make it any more difficult, you know, because uh, <coughs> the, the rugby was getting really serious and, you know, you're getting a bit older and good players are coming through and, you know, and th there was so much mental aspect of critiquing performance and people proving their worth, you know, within the, sort of managerial side of it that became quite burdensome, you know. So it was quite nice to be able to go out of that into the levity of doing TV and, and focus on Charlie's. So I remember working at Charlie's and saying, guys, I've got to go on a Monday, at, you know, to film uh, Game of Two Halves, which was live as well. So it filmed live, and there might be a quick edit, but it, we filmed it literally, and it's a half-hour show. It took 45 minutes, taking off for lunch and then coming back to work in the afternoon, you know. So we... We were packing it in, but it was, uh, you know, it, it was, you know, so you had an, an hour of Game of Two Halves and an hour of Sports Cafe, two hours a week, and that was it. Yeah. It wasn't really that yeah. heinous. Was there a time when the Mark and Matthew train ended? Like, you, like Shay said, you guys dominated every show, and then was there one that didn't work, or like, how did that, did you just decide you weren't going to do it anymore? Um, I think the last one we did was like a Rocky Road thing, and they, they, they went all right. But you, you do get the powers that be at TVNZ saying, oh, no, no, we think it should be on a, a Sunday night or no, on a Friday night at 8.30. It's like, mate, our guys are out having a few beers on a Friday night at 8.30, you dick. How can you possibly actually table that as a serious suggestion? Yeah. So not that we cared too much, but um, we sort of just, uh, I think it had ran, ran, ran in course. And, and then... Um, Kids were in, in the mix, and you know we knew the chapter had to close. But I reckon if, if we did a, I always remember saying to Reggie, you know, imagine if we were doing this when we were sixty, <laughs> and still competing against each other because we're still competitive, and still doing the same things like wrestling and you know. But as sixty-year-olds, I reckon it'd be actually funnier. <laughs> yeah. I said it'd be. This is going to be so much funnier if we do it when we're sixty than if we do it now. But you know, I think the the world's moved, and there's. A whole raft of things you could look at. Not many people have tuned in for that. They might for a one. -off. Has it moved? I think people would tune yeah. in for a Mark oh, and Matthew nice. reunion. There's an appetite for that. One of the intriguing parts of the storyline, which I've, I'm really interested to ask, is you've done the TV and that kind of stops, and you're into the fatherhood chapter. I'm, I'm guessing, and the Charlies, and you've cashed out the Charlies, and you've got enough money to last you a number of lifetimes. But then you come back and do the radio stint, more FM with Haley Holt, and it's. <laughs> Like I imagine 4.45, 4.30 a.m. wake-ups every day, and you do that for two years. So you don't need to do that, but you choose to. Like, what is that? What do you reflect on that period? Um, it was just a discipline thing for me. 
like uh, most people, and I don't, I'm not into generational wealth. Um, most people blow it early, and I knew I was never going to do that. But I just wanted to put some really strict disciplines around myself to ensure that every moment of my time was spent uh, for two years um, working, so that there was I could learn to have that bank account. Because so, is that is that an odd thing to wake up one morning and have access to that amount of money? Well, it's like winning lotto, I suspect. Yeah. But um, uh, it, as, as I said, it, it, it doesn't it didn't change me. I just wanted to make sure that I was very disciplined so that uh, there was no risk of it becoming a thing. But I bet people at your local cafe are sipping their flat whites, looking over at you, reading in the paper how much money you've earned as well and gone. That's the, they may have done, but I, I never, never, never felt that. But that, 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 that is, I, I think, whenever we get people who have risen I've always to had to shout a few rounds with them. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Even at Varsity, because you know, I had a sponsorship from Jock Hobbs had given me a sponsorship from Mizuno, so like, he gave me five grand to wear his boots when I was a, a, a school kid. So I didn't have a student, never had a student loan. Yeah. Varsity, so there was always, you know, always being generous. I mean, Ben might deny that, but always being generous. I'd like to think and buying the odd round. Um, but fascinating character study. I, yeah, I love when we get people on that have risen to the top of their fields, and I find little examples of why they are where they are. And it's a guy who doesn't need to work anymore, and he gets up at four thirty every morning for two years to do a radio show because he needs that. Just because, because it's something he thinks he should do for no reason other than to instill some discipline in his life. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not a natural fit either, more FM, but uh, the reason I did that was because I wanted to have to turn on. You know, I quite like live, um, but also the fact that you're talking to Karen, you know, which was what they called her, Karen, who's a mum of two kids, before the, you know, the Karen thing happened. Oh, was, uh, it, was it your audience demo? Yeah, you have to have a, a filter on, you know, so that you're filtering it for that environment, which I thought was a bit more challenging than doing the hits or, or something, or the rock, which would be a bit more... Natural off the cuff, you could say what you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Ratings might suggest that that wasn't a great idea. <laughs> yeah. was, it, was it hard to rein in your natural personality? Oh yeah, yeah. On? I mean, it wasn't it wasn't a natural fit, you know. But I thought that was kind of challenging. And then we got Haley along, and Haley's a loose cannon. I love Haley; she's a, a great lady. And uh, so she she and I just get on like a house on fire. And that was neither of our fit, you know, as was best exemplified when she uh, may have had a few sherbets on air one day and That's let right. go of a couple of expletives, which Karen doesn't like. Uh -huh. the two kids that, was car. Big, that was big news too. That was funny. The, the other one that was and then we did a drug test live on air. And uh, we, you know, and Stu and <laughs> Hayley failed. <laughs> and, and what a really bad idea, you know. And so I went in and uh, just basically got a tea bag and made it look like piss and poured it into a thing and came out, mine was clear, and it's like tut, tut, tut at the wall, you know. How dare you? Shame on you! <laughs> Who has come up with that idea? Let's do a yeah. drug test on air, yeah. but we're not sure if we're going to pass it, actually. Yeah. Fucking hell. So, mate, like, there have been three fails if I hadn't put the tea bag in the pretty... <laughs> uh, I'm keen to... We won't keep you much longer, but this has been amazing, by the way. But um, the marketing, like the guerrilla marketing stuff, I think fascinating, because you've got a degree in marketing. And what was the the Rangi Toto uh, explosion? The, the, the mint, mint shot? Is it? Yeah, mint shot. yeah, that was uh, it was a good, that was Ben Hickey again, the guy's foot I cut off, uh, the human cannibal. Uh, that was his idea, and effectively it was to, because nobody's watching ads, you know, in this user generated and controlled environment. So we were saying, look, we'll incentivise you to watch ads. So you watch these ads, watch them very closely. At the end of them, you get asked a question, and we'll give you a virtual currency. So it was actually a bit ahead of its time. Wow. And we'll give you a virtual currency that you can spend on all of the products that the people who's advertising. So we, we're giving away 10 minis. So you watch a mini ad, get out a question. I remember that now. And you, yeah. you bank your money. Problem was, if you watched all the ads, you'd end up with the same amount. But then you could go into a virtual casino and gamble it or bet on uh, sporting fixtures to delineate yeah. the winners and losers. So it was actually quite a good idea. Um, and then uh, you could, you know, work it. You could buy in a virtual online auction the prizes that have been donated by the sponsors. And uh, so we, you know, the global financial crisis hit and the first marketing money that goes is away from online media or social media because it's, it's, uh, it's new. So everyone goes back to the tried and proven as they 
you know, pull the reins in. And, you know, I'd always heard about somebody going up to Rangitoto with 15 tyres on their back and lighting it. And uh, so I said, oh, shit, boys, we can do better than that. <laughs> and so we spoke to Paul Davidson, QC, who's now a judge, who was the best in town, and said, look, mate, what's the legal wiggle room if somebody, uh, you know, is driving over the hard bridge and goes, fuck, Rangitoto's are up and <laughs> drives off the bridge. And he did, it's, called, it's called causation, Mark. You'd have to prove that, that it happened as a direct result of that. Or what if they had a heart attack or did they have a bad heart beforehand, you know? So there's a bit of legal wiggle yeah. room there. Not only that, but I went and got HASNO certified, which is health and safety, you know. I, so I can, I can actually carry 800 kilos of ex, explosive fertiliser, which I may take as another alternative to, you know, the... The suicidal cook, cook straight, yeah, yeah the cook straight jump. Something. I might take that to government and pop those buggers at some stage. Um, we'll edit that bit out as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, if I get to eighty five, you know, and it's going as badly as it is now, mate. I'm I'm down there with my trailer of fertilizer. <laughs> I, I jest. Um, where was I going with this? You were up Rangitoto with six, oh, six, yeah, 600 yeah. kgs No, no, of well, we actually took 1,000 kilos up there and uh, we took it up on the back of quad bikes and we took a boat across at night and the weather was perfect and it was designed to give us a plume the same width and height as Rangitoto, but the wind caught it and gave us a big lick. But we got up there and we let off 1,000 kilos and the only thing that got damaged was the sign on the trig that said no lighting of fires melted in half. You know? <laughs> And then, of course, you need a, a, the protagonist, antagonist thing, and Doc said, oh, this is hugely demoralising and can't believe anyone had done it, but it's fertiliser, so if Rangitoto looks greener, mm. you can thank us. You will. So we ticked all of the boxes and made sure that it was squeaky clean, and apart from the replacement of a sign that was, you know, went off without, without a flaw, really, and got us, you know, some attention, and, you know, by my, we did some analysis on, you know, what we'd spent and what it returned, and it was, you know, not a bad promotion. Amazing. Yeah, I love the, the ideas and then you actually pull through with them. What is your, bringing you into the now, what does your day-to-day -day look like at Blanco? Like, are you coming up with these ideas still or are you sort of overseeing? No, I, I'm uh, more passive these days, to be perfectly honest. So uh, mainly um, invested in one or two things and sort of uh, sitting back and, you know, going for the odd sauna. And, you know, I like to train, so I, I, I try and do that every day because that's good for my mental health. Um and uh, going to the office every day and, you know, we, we have a great client in Toyota who I've learnt a huge amount from. We spent uh, many years working for Toyota uh, Global out of uh, to uh, uh, Tokyo. Um, and uh, what a fantastic company. I mean, they, the, the way that they look at the world and the product that they create and the Kaizen, which is constant improvement, uh, and, and the, the processes and the, it's just been mind-blowing really I mean I thought Charlie's was pretty slack and certainly the guys who who who, who bought it and the people we learned off who assisted us with distribution and so forth but to see the the magnitude of a company that spends two billion dollars a year on research and development uh, you know it's just been quite eye-opening so it's been you know a, a lovely chapter that's taught me a, a whole lot and and how long's that relationship been going? Uh, Ten years. Far out. Yeah. So, uh, we're we're very lucky. Is that your is that your main client? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. The the stage you're in, which is amazing, the fatherhood stage, is now. Uh, the kids are young, and it's the most important thing you do. You're young. You're 51. You've got a lot of good years ahead of you. Do you think there'll be a time? when you come back onto screens or broadcasting or, or, or any sense of public, Mark? No, I've, ne I've never really looked back. Um, I, I don't have a, a, a yearning or a longing to, to do it. You know, there's some stuff I find funny, which, uh, um, you know, the majority probably don't anymore, you know. So, I don't know, it was a nice, it was a nice chapter. There'd be certain things that you'd, you, you know, you, you have ideas and go, oh, I reckon that'd make a bloody good show. Um, but... You know, pulling through with it and actually making it happen. I mean, it's a it's, uh, path of least resistance at, at my age and stage. Yeah. Do, do you enjoy your anonymity, your relative anonymity now? Like, you, you popped yeah. up on The Crowd Goes Wild, I think, last year in the Uncommonwealth Games over at the Millennium. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. And I saw that and I thought, fuck, I haven't seen this guy in years. Yeah, yeah. So is, is that how you prefer to play your life now? Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, there was. I remember um, I, was, I was going out with uh, Mandy Smith, Dean Barker's wife. Uh, many moons ago when we first moved to Auckland 
and we'd been boyfriend and girlfriend at university and and uh she and i was doing tv and she got offered a tv thing and i said ah think about it seriously because there's no price you can put on your anonymity that exact quote and uh can't recall whether she did it or not but um you know but from one day to the next you know it didn't matter what i'd done with rugby but the moment you're on the idiot box you're walking down the street and you can see people looking at you and it's it's it, it's a it's something very different something that you uh you know you, you you until you've done it you don't really you don't really get it and it's uh it's it's not not something i dig that much has it waned over the years or is it still oh yeah shit yeah mate i, I can go out now and nobody would have a clue really yeah shit i find that hard to believe um just a couple of big question uh big picture questions for me just to finish uh, i love people that can i grab another beer sorry yeah i mean we yeah shit, yeah. yeah hell yeah well you don't need to move oh move. shit <clears throat> the old knees <laughs> i had i had a half knee replacement the other day did you the other day, like, actually, the other day or the other? Oh, a few years ago. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, oh, yeah. But I can, I can now run on it. Like I couldn't, I couldn't run on it before then. Bloody really? amazing the technology. Is that an old oh. war wound from your playing days? Oh, it's just bad genetics. Blame oh. the folks. Oh dear. They've done such a good job with so many other areas, though. <laughs> it seems you speak about them with great pride. Oh, they're they're wonderful people, and I'm very fortunate to have my folks still with me, mm. and. Uh, you know, so we're we're a, a very blessed family, very lucky. Yeah, yeah. A couple of big picture questions. Um, I love people that again have risen to success, and I want to ask them how they did it. Like, you know, sport and TV and business, you've risen to the top. Is there anything reflecting on it that you pinpoint? Like, is it your competitiveness? Is it just yep, your absolutely. will to to continue learning? No, no. It's uh, I got uh, told by my old man. Uh, actually gets me a bit emotional but he, he uh, said you can if you if you dream it you can do it anything you know so I just and he was my uh, Batman right who was my favorite superhero and so Batman saying mate if you dream it you can do it that was all I needed was just to be told by my superhero that if you want to do it you'll, you you can make it happen so when I tuck my little boy into bed every night I say mate if you keep going the way that you've begun you could quite possibly be the greatest man who ever lived, you know. And, and I think those positive affirmations from parents are so absolutely pivotal and vital. And I'm, I'm sure. I mean, genetically, I shouldn't, you know. Physically, I'm, I, I was even small back back then. But playing playing sport. But I just got told, go for it. You can do it. In fact, you will do it. You know. And so, attitudinally, I thought, I'm into it. Did your dad also? And also, I mean, let, let's, you know it back a bit. I mean, you know, success in New Zealand is a big old world. No, it's not, <laughs> not, 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 not quite the same as, I mean, you know, you, you, we, we see a little bit of it when the America's Cup coming to the harbour, you know, there's, you know, you say, oh, he, shit, he's got a nice launch and then, bang, you know, and somebody, Larry Ellison comes in and it's, you know, needs to be parked down at Prince's Wharf because it's too bloody big. You know, it's a big old world. It is a big old world. But in terms of New Zealand, you've clocked it. Yeah, and like, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. say one thing as well. A wise man about 30 minutes ago said to me, you celebrate your successes regardless. You take, you stop and you take stock of, of, of the yeah, good things yeah, that you've yeah. done. So I think it's okay to uh, to allow yourself a little bit of success here in New Zealand. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, you know, uh, I, I've never celebrated that. <laughs> little, little successes and the things... I mean, I always got told by my teachers, oh, you'll never get a degree. And so, to you. But the reality is, uh, I, I celebrate those uh, things more than the natural gifts that you got given. Like, I always catch a ball and run with it. But um, to succeed commercially or to come up with an idea that somebody wants to pay you some money for because they think it's quite good, that's always been the time where you take heed and give yourself a, you know, shout yourself a, a Negroni or, you know, or something along those lines. But... You know, not so much the sporting bit, which is actually a very small part of your life, too. That's which, but it's such a it's such a public part as well, and a prominent mm. part, and a part that plays a big part in in bystanders' kind of admirations as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I look f f any kid, you know, these days, go and get a bloody degree. You know, that that's not that that's going to guarantee you any success. Most lots of people succeed without it, but do your best academically, because you've got. 40 years working, and Christian Cullen, best All Black I've ever seen, how many years did he have? You know, playing for the All Blacks, five years? Mm. 
that's not enough to retire, I don't think. Yeah. You know? And he was the best I've ever seen. I mean, I'm, I, I'm guessing. I don't know. I think, um, speaking on behalf of New Zealand, the, <laughs> the thing that's most appealing about you is your authenticity and your ability to just say whatever. And, and I think, I don't want to misquote your dad, did he say something like, if it's fun and it's not going to hurt anyone, go for it? Yeah, do it. Yeah. If, 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 if uh, what was the quote? It was, uh, yeah, if, if it's fun and it doesn't hurt anyone, do it. That was it, you know. So that's the way I've lived my life. And, and also being told, you know, if you dream it, you can do it. And that's the advice I've given any uh, kid who's sort of wanted a tip in any, any direction. It doesn't matter what direction it is. It's lie on your back, stare at the blue sky and dream. Because if you don't have dreams, you, you've got no bloody show of knowing where you're going. And, and what, what better thing to spend your time doing than fantasising, you know? What do you fantasise about now? Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you need another beer, mate. Careful how you answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I stand by my oh, question. Look, you know, and I'll, I'll quite happily answer that. Uh, just to see my kids grow up and do better than, than, than I've done. Every generation, you want to be better than the one before. And I genuinely believe my kids will, you know, make me look pretty bloody, you know, ordinary. Uh, and, and when I say that, Health and happiness is all I want for them. I don't, you know, nothing else matters. In the in the scheme of things, it's as perennial as the grass. Shay uh, did allude to this at the start. I was going to ask you a question. Uh, fourth child arriving shortly. Have you got any tips for uh, you know dealing with lots of kids, big families? But uh, just celebrate it, and it goes so fast. I remember my parents saying, "Ah, oh, it goes so quick." You know, and uh, here I am, and my eldest has just turned 13, and my little boy's turning 12, and the other two are now five and three, and I'm just going, Pow! it does happen so quickly. So enjoy every bloody moment of the day, don't you reckon? Yeah, big time, big yeah. time. Um, it hasn't aged you. You're looking incredible. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, you might, might need a bit of dye in the hair. No, nah, keep nah, it as it is. Nah. You keep die, it as you it dying is. the uh, the beer there. That's, no, it's that's going. It's incredible. I'll, yeah, and I'm letting I'm letting it go. Very Bud Spencer. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure who that is, but thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, you're gonna check though. <laughs> yeah, I will do. I'll, I'll Google it straight away. <laughs> hey, look, we're we're starting to wrap up. So Shay is our outro guy. I'm just gonna say a little bit before I throw to him. Um, Mark, you have been our dream guest for since we started this thing. Like I said, we've we've always wanted you on. You're the most in demand from our audience. The stories you've shared and the roller coaster of your life and all the highs has been inspirational and your ability to tell stories is unmatched. So thank you so much for coming in and sharing a few beers with us. Uh, it's been awesome. It's been like a dream come true. Shay? Fuck, you've just done the outro. <laughs> I'll, try, I'll try and mop up some bits. Um, I, said on, I think I said at the start, mate, I, I idolised you growing up and that's <laughs> the biggest compliment I can pay in terms of being a kid that grew up in New Zealand, seeing someone that they wanted to be like. And I read this, um, I read this quote in, in the research for the episode, and it was something that you took away from university, and it's a quote that's close to my heart as well, but it's in a wider context. And that was, if there was a, one particular lesson that I think is more important than a degree was, to borrow a quote, to walk with kings nor lose the common touch. Yeah, yeah. To Absolutely. be able to talk to people because you meet people at university from very, very privileged backgrounds and those who aren't, and I love both the same. That... Rudyard Kipling quote from If is mm. how I've always wanted to live my life as well, is to be able to relate to the everyday person or the person that you see in a boardroom or whoever that is, and you've encapsulated it perfectly. And the fact that you can go from being probably New Zealand's most prominent face at the peak of their powers to then going, uh, actually, what's more important than fame, more important than money, more important than all of those things is to spend time with my kids and my family I think speaks volumes to your character and it's really amazing to get the opportunity to sit down and, and yarn and reminisce about the good times but also hear that w those wisdoms and those things that you're going to pass on to your kids so that they will be better than you growing up in the future so oh, th thank you kind gentlemen shit that's uh, the, the kindest i've ever heard anyone speak about me so uh but i, I will say to to that that's the new zealand way you know to me you know that that Kipling quote, and I remember uh, sitting down with Bob Jones, who was our hero when we were growing up in Wellington, and his uh, nephew, 
uh, lived two doors down and with his sister. And I got invited to his place at one stage and it was like this castle on the hill, you know, out in the hut. And uh, he came out and he's wearing a bathrobe. And he said, touch anything, a gun comes out of the ceiling and shoots you. Right? And I went, oh. And then, you know, I go outside and there's like 50 nude people swimming around in the pool. And, and, and I remember saying to him, mate, do you, do you think that uh, you've got a better life than the Marion Tolliga Bay quote? Um, who rows his dinghy out each day and gets uh, Kamoana and brings it back to the whanau in, in the marae. He said, of course it is. I can go anywhere, I can do this, I can do that. I can, I can go and say, and I said, well, why then do I have just as much fun with him as I have with you? It's the only time I've shut, not shut Bob Jones up, but the only time he hasn't had an answer for a question. And that, to me, is New Zealand, right? And uh, let's hope, like hell, it's New Zealand for generations to come. Mark Ellis, thank you so much for your time.